Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth be the meditation at the end of this day. May our meditation be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Ash Wednesday, and today is also Valentine's Day. Yep. Isn't this a crazy combination? You know, Valentine's Day, really kind of a lot about the flesh and also about the heart because St. Valentine was a Christian. But Ash Wednesday, brokenness, sorrow. From dust we came and to dust we shall return. What kind of a happy message is this? It's just a truthful message. We were created from dust and because of our sin, one day we will return to dust, waiting for that resurrection of all flesh. In your bulletin is a sermon outline, so if you got one of the bulletins, you can grab that, because we're going to be looking at mercy. We're going to be looking at mercy today and in the Lenten season, and I don't know about you, there's sometimes um, we use words that we don't know the meaning of. You ever done that? I, I remember when I was in high school, I used a word I didn't know the meaning to. I'm not going to tell you. My mom said, hey, I don't know if you really want to use that word. It wasn't a bad word. It's just a kind of awkward word. And sometimes people use words, they talk to us, and we don't know the meaning of the words. And we just kind of go along with it. We never ask, what does that mean? We don't Google it. We just carry on because we kind of get a gist of what they're saying by the rest of the sentence. And I think mercy is a word that oftentimes in the church, we don't really fully grasp. And so I want us to, in our beginning part of the sermon, just to kind of focus on the, what is that word mercy? What is it all about? What does it mean? Mercy is the gift given to the guilty. Mercy only applies to those who are guilty. And so it's a very rich and it's a very deep word. It's a word that makes like help and aid and comfort incredibly shallow because we can do that to someone who kind of deserves it. Mercy deals with the worst of the worst. Mercy deals with something that is given to those who are poor, miserable sinners. They're guilty. So mercy is the gift that is given to the guilty, and mercy is not found in a state of innocence, nor is it sought before the sentence is sure. No one in a court of law pleads for mercy until the verdict has been rendered. No one walks in on the first day of the trial and says, mercy, mercy, please show me mercy. No, they're trying to prove that they're not guilty. It's when it comes to the sentencing stage, when the, the verdict has been declared, and now the judge has to declare a sentence, a punishment for their sin, that they now, because they are guilty, everybody knows they're guilty, now they ask for mercy. And so mercy is not a state of innocence. It is for the guilty. Warren Wearsby, a pastor, said, God's grace gives us what we do not deserve, while God's mercy does not give us what we do deserve. Now that's kind of a riddle almost, isn't it? You, you, you got to think about it. You got to look at it. You got to read those words and let them sink in. Otherwise, you can get confused. I think grace and mercy are kind of the same thing. They're always kind of said together in the church, even though they are totally different. Growing up, my parents showed me mercy. I was guilty. I was wrong. At times, it, the need for mercy kind of shows who we are. In Ephesians chapter 2, it words it this way, As for you... You were dead in your transgressions and sins, gratifying the cravings of your flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. You might want to underline those words, deserving of wrath. We, we deserve God's wrath, for we have sinned and we are guilty. He is holy and we are not. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. On our own, we're dead. 
Paul says. We're caught, red-handed, deserving of God's wrath. But in the Lamb, in the precious blood of the Lamb, our sin is washed away. We are declared holy, even if we don't feel very holy. God's mercy is at work within us. Justice and mercy could be, I, I should have not probably used the words could be, I should have just said justice and mercy are opposites. They are opposites. Justice demands action take place. Justice demands that a right is, is punished or a, a wrong is punished. Justice demands action. Mercy, mercy withholds the action that one deserves. There's a story that kind of captures, reminds me of that, that how justice and mercy are total opposites. Uh, a politician one time wanted to get his picture taken by a famous photographer. So he called up the photographer, invited him over. The photographer came and had a sitting with the politician, took pictures from all different angles and all different lightings. He, he got him ready, and then he, the photographer chose the the pictures that he felt were the best. And he took them to the politician and presented them before him. The politician looks through the pictures one by one. And after a while, he's frustrated the photographer. He, he felt like the photographer didn't do a good job. And he says, these pictures are terrible. They don't do my face justice. And the photographer hurt that he was questioned for his artistic skill looked at the politician and said, with a face like that, you need mercy, not justice. Hopefully you remember the difference now between justice and mercy. Yeah, we're guilty. We're wrong. We fall short. And we don't want justice. We don't want God's wrath. And so we fall upon mercy. So how can God be both just and merciful? Those are two of the attributes of God, right? God is just. He's fair. He takes action against that, what is, that which is wrong. How can God be both just and merciful? It's an honest question. It's a kind of a, a deep question. How can God be both just and merciful? How it takes place is that Jesus gets the justice. On the cross of Calvary, Jesus got the justice that we deserve. He endured the wrath that had our names on it. Justice is laid upon Jesus. And in this season of Lent, that's what we kind of focus on, that, that Jesus is enduring the just punishment for my sin, for mine. It's my sin that led him to the cross. It's for me that he suffered and died. He endured and took upon himself God's just punishment for me. Jesus gets the justice. We receive the mercy of God. We receive the mercy of God. Casting crowns in their song, The Altar and the Door, I've, I've heard this song for a long, long time. I never really, until I was looking at it, kind of capture what they're saying here. Jesus can, sh Jesus, can you show me just how far the east is from the west? You know, that's Psalm 103, you know, as far as the east is from the west, so far has God removed our transgressions. And so they say, hey, Jesus, can you show me how far it is from the east to the west that you talk about in Psalm 103? Because I can't bear to see the man I've been rising up in me again. And that is our struggle, isn't it? When you look in the mirror, when you're honest and you examine yourself against not the news, but against the holiness of a perfect God, you see this rising up in us again and again and again. And then they go on, in the arms of your mercy, I find rest. 
Because you know how far the east is from the west. How far is it from the east to the west? From one scarred hand to another. I never caught that. I, I knew the words, but they're saying the distance between the east and the west is found in you, Jesus. From one scarred hand where you endured the just punishment of my sin to the other. That's the great exchange. That's the great exchange. Jesus takes upon himself our punishment and we receive mercy and his holiness. The holiness of Christ adorns us by grace. Tim Keller in his quote from Prodigal God that we read a few years ago said, talked about this. Mercy and forgiveness must be free and unmerited to the wrongdoer. If the wrongdoer has to do something to merit it, then it isn't mercy. But forgiveness always comes at a cost to the one granting forgiveness. It comes at a cost. Mercy and forgiveness must be free and unmerited to the wrongdoer. Oh, how rich that is that Jesus endured it for us and gives us the wrongdoer's mercy. In the Old Testament, this picture of the mercy seat is pretty significant. Remember, remember Pastor uh, Mark, when he was here, had that one sermon about the mercy seat, you know, the Ark of the Covenant with the, the cherubs and that, that seat that between the two cherubs and the Ark of the Covenant was called the mercy seat. And remember, he had the pictures and stuff. So I'm not going to revisit all of that. But it's really interesting that mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat was hidden behind a veil. It was be hidden behind the holies. It, it was hidden behind the court of the, the men, and then the court of the, the women, and then the court of the Gentiles. If you were a Gentile, unclean in a sense, it was hidden behind all of this. And then the lamb, the final Passover, was sacrificed. And remember what happened to that which blocked the mercy seat, if it would have been there in the Holy of Holies. If, if what happened when Jesus died, the curtain was torn. That which was blocking, that what was separating us from that mercy seat when Christ died is torn. And access is granted unto us. Paul talks about this way. Remember that at the time you were separated from Christ. You were Gentiles. You were unclean. You were wrongdoers. Excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise. Without hope and without God in the world. And then Jesus did his awesome work. And now the church, the church is wide open. So what has God done? Brother Lawrence, in his book, The Practice of the Presence of God, kind of talks about this, um, this beauty of mercy, of not getting what you deserve. He, he writes this, I regard myself as the most wretched of all men. Sounds a little bit like St. Paul, doesn't it? stinking and covered with sores, and as one who has committed all sorts of crimes against his king. Overcome by remorse, I confess all my wickedness to him, ask his pardon, and abandon myself entirely to him to do with as he will. But this king, filled with goodness and mercy, far from chastising me, lovingly embraces me. He makes me eat at his table. He serves me with his own hand. He gives me the keys of his treasures and treats me as his favorite. He talks with me and he is delighted with me. In a thousand and one ways, he forgives me and relieves me from my principal bad habits without talking about them. 
I beg him to make me according to his heart. And always the more weak and despicable I see myself, the more beloved I am. That is mercy. I'm guilty. But we don't get what we deserve. In Psalm 51, King David, after he was caught with his sin with Bathsheba, cries out, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness. This is his confession. According to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. This is David's plea. This was Brother Lawrence's plea. This was Paul's plea. And it's our plea. Lord, have mercy on me according to your loving kindness. David needed mercy for he was guilty. Story is told by Ernest Hemingway when he was in Madrid, Spain one time that um, he came across a story of a father. A father whose son became rebellious, a a father whose son treated the family horribly, the story of a son who ran away. But the father kept looking for the son. The father would go to the different places and he, he could never find his son. A few, a very few people saw him weeks beforehand, but he could never find his son in Madrid. And so one day, this father took out an ad in the newspaper, the Madrid newspaper, and it said, Son, I love you. On Friday, and he gave the date, will you meet me in front of the newspaper office's front door? Paco, I love you. I forgive you. Meet me at noon. And so the father at noon on Friday makes his way to the the front door of the office of the Madrid newspaper. And he starts looking for his son. In the process of looking for his son, he met 80 Pacos who needed mercy from their father. And so we gather on this Ash Wednesday covered in dust because our heart cries out, Oh God, according to your loving kindness, will you show me mercy? For I am guilty. I am guilty. This Lent, we want to look at mercy, God's mercy in our lives at different times, at different times of our lives. We want... As we journey through the season of Lent, every Wednesday evening, if you can join us, we're going to look at mercy. Mercy, mercy, mercy in the different times, in the, in the times of life where there's temptation, in the time of life when there's suffering, in the times of life when there's betrayal, in the times of life where there's relationship struggles, in the times of life when we serve. About three months ago, I asked five of the lay ministers, hey, will you guys take the kind of the message, the Bible study, the the homily for this? And and they were all anxious and troubled. But all five of them said, I'll do it, as long as you pray for me. And in a sense, they just asked what we need. Will you be merciful to us, Pastor? Pastor? And so we've met, we've talked, we looked at Scripture, we've dialogued about what they're going to say. We're going to talk about the same thing, mercy. And how mercy shows up in the different times of life. You see the the list there, the meal at six. We're going to meet in the gathering room and we'll have our study and celebration in the gathering room. And if we find out we can't hold everybody, the second week we'll figure something out. Um, But I encourage you just to ponder this Lenten season, the beautiful gift that God is merciful. On the bottom, as we wrap up our reflections today, let us rest in and cherish God's mercy to us. Where has Jesus set you free? 
And maybe you don't want to write it down. I encourage you to think about it. Where has God shown mercy to you, a guilty wrongdoer who's trespassed against a holy God in thought, word, and deed? Is it your chasing after materialism? Is it your anger? Is it your lust? Is it your greed and selfishness? Where has God's mercy touched you the deepest? He says, come home. And then the second question, let us be renewed by to be merciful unto others. Who can you show mercy to this week? Remember, mercy is applied to someone who's guilty. So who really ticks you off? Who drives you nuts? Who frustrates the, and quit looking at your spouses, um, who frustrates the bejabbers out of you? I saw some of you, and it's like, stop that. It's Valentine's Day. Do it tomorrow, okay? Not today. Who frustrates you? Who's in the wrong? But because they're in the wrong, now you get the beautiful opportunity to show them mercy. This one you might want to write a name down to. So you don't forget who, who is guilty. But boy, do they need mercy. And because God has been merciful to me, I will. In his power, show them mercy also. Heavenly Father, thank you that you are merciful, that you are just. And Jesus, you raised the hand and you said, I will take, I will endure the just punishment for each and every one of us. And not just for us, for the sins of the whole world, for every single person, Jesus, you endured the cross for. Oh, Jesus, thank you for your mercy. Spirit, let us rejoice in the weeks ahead where we see your mercy at work. For it's in the name of the Lamb we pray. Amen. Amen.